Hi folks, uh, I'm Marco and welcome to the last talk of the day, which is called why you don't need to worry about scaling your Java web application. Now, before I forget and before we start our talk, one last mention. If you have any questions, and I hope I'll be able to process all the questions afterwards at the end of the talk, please go to Slido or Slido code Geekon 2022, room number one, and I'll do my best to answer the questions. Now, how did this talk come about? I don't know about you, but maybe you've had the situation in the past where you built a new product and then someone, maybe a business person, came in shortly before launch and said, hey, what about our app gets a thousand users, simultaneous users, whatever, will it be able to scale? Or 10,000 users or some random made up number? Or suddenly you, I don't know, make a photo upload website and they tell you what happens if every photo is 50 megabytes and then we have 5,000 users up there uploading all these photos. What do you do? And then you could obviously mumble something along the lines, yeah, yeah, auto-scaling, Kubernetes cluster, blah, blah. Or you try to go down the rabbit hole. And the rabbit hole is Java performance, web server performance, and the whole universe surrounding that. Another part of that rabbit hole, or a tiny part of the rabbit hole actually, is let me just go to the Amazon EC2 instance type website. So you built your web application and then you want to deploy it very simple on EC2. You go on that website, you see that you have multiple categories for computer types. The general purpose category, you can see you've got like 15 different instance types. Then you go to computer optimized from C7G to C4, whatever, 10 more instance types. Memory optimized, whoops, from R6G to Z1D. Accelerated computing, it gets crazy with, with all these <laughs> different instance types. What type of instance would you use to deploy your web application and how do you know? That is actually the real question behind it. And it's not so much about showing you what specific instance type you will need for your application, but more about the process of how you would find out what could work in your case. One of these instances, maybe a Raspberry Pi at home or something else. And I thought, I don't just want to claim stuff, I need to, before I give this talk, check back with a couple of people who might know a thing or two about this whole topic. <laughs> and I thought, hmm, web servers, let's see, I could maybe get in touch with the Nginx people, maybe they've seen some big Nginx installations, or in the Java universe, maybe Tomcat the web server, or maybe Jetty the web server. And I found that the Jetty developers, they have tons of performance material on, the, on their website, they have tons of stuff on Stack Overflow where they basically answered, well, we have Jetty installations running uh, 10,000 open connections on one instance or 100,000 connections open on one instance. And I thought, ooh, they sound like they might know something. And I got in touch with them and we had plenty of, <laughs> let's say, teaching sessions. And well, first of all, a big thanks to the Jetty developers. And the next thing is I want to show you the process that they kind of taught me or parts of the process. So you can go back home and do the same thing you just see me do here now in the next 40 minutes or so. And don't believe any of my claims. I just want to repeat yourself whatever you see me doing basically now. Right. That means enough with the boring background. What we're going to do is I'm going to start drawing and you're going to start enjoying my handwriting skills. <laughs> because I haven't practiced them in a long while. So what I, what I thought about is um, obviously part of how we would find out what type of instance I would need is to do some good old load testing. And not just any load testing like uh, spawn up JMeter on my developer laptop and then, you know, whatever, <laughs> send some requests and then come with some random number to my boss and tell him, yay, th this kind of works. But having a more scientific, scientific is a big word, but let's say a more reliable approach to things. And as always, I want to start really, really, really simple. So. 
I don't want to start with a microservice universe where we have 20 connected microservices. Instead, what we're going to do, what we're going to start out with, is we're going to have one box here, and that box is our server. Hopefully you can read that. I try my best. Well, it's pretty big. The server is going to be to keep, again, to keep things real simple, what we're going to do is we're going to use an embedded Chetty web server. You could, in fact, use any web, you know, whatever you want, but Chetty is just a couple of lines of code to boot it up, and then you're good to go. You can also use embedded Tomcat, whatever have you. And then let's assume our business application at the moment, we're not working for Twitter scale applications, we're working for a boring company making boring stuff, and uh, we could have an endpoint. So our application only has one endpoint at the moment, one JSON endpoint, one times JSON. Let's say you work for the tax office. There is one JSON endpoint slash tax rate. Whenever you call that endpoint, what you get back is a good old JSON message. Uh, in my case, what we're going to get back is we're going to get the name back. The endpoint doesn't make too much sense, to be honest. But let's say I get a German tax rate back for whatever reason, and the rate, and the rate is like 19% of whatever it is. So VAT, VAT rates. That's what we're going to start out with. There's not going to be a database. Don't think I'm cheating now. No, we're going to need to learn the process. And later on, at the end, we're going to add all this stuff, databases, other systems, and whatnot. Let me just quickly show you the code repository I have. You, you'll find the link at the end. And I'm going to show you the magic servlet. For whatever reason, I closed down IntelliJ. Let's see. Here we go. That is our servlet. It is one do gap method. What we're going to do is we have a bogus object here, which is a tax rate object. It only has two fields, a name, German VAT. And every request you make against the servlet generates a random number. So you don't get 19% back, you get whatever, a random number back. We write this stuff to the servlet output stream. And in fact, I'm not using a library to transform my tax rate object to JSON. I'm doing the poor man's version, which means yay, string concatenation. All of that doesn't matter at the moment. What you want to do, again, I'm stressing this out, is learn the whole process and add more complexity later on. Right, so enough with that. Back to our whiteboard. We have our server. In load testing, as I mentioned already, it's not a good idea to run everything on your developer laptop. Instead, what you want to do is you want to have more boxes here. Let me draw one box, two boxes three boxes, four boxes in that case. These boxes are called loaders. So loader one, loader two, loader three, loader four. The only thing they do is they call my server. More specifically, they call the tax rate endpoint. Obviously, with varying loads. So what you're going to do is we're going to tell the loaders, hey, loaders, please send maybe 1,000 requests per second uh, against the endpoint, 500, whatever. That's the job of the loaders. It doesn't have to be four loaders. It can be 10 loaders, one loader, whatever. I'll tell you exactly how you would find that out in a second. But before we come to that, there's one more thing. The loaders themselves, they just generate some load but they don't measure latency, the response times. For that, a concept, and it's debatable, we can discuss it later on, but there's another concept, another box I'm going to write here. That box is called the probe. The probe doesn't really generate load here. It calls the same endpoint, but it calls the same endpoint with just one, two requests per second. So it just goes like a user, like one single user, it goes like, OK, what's the tax rate? What's the tax rate? And we want to find out from the probe, hey probe, how do your latencies change? So latency, if we crank up the load. That is the main idea behind that. Why do we split all this up? Well, 
The thing is, generating load, for example, takes CPU, memory, network, and for example, server and loaders, you want to split them up because you don't want to influence each other. That generating the load takes away from the server's handling capabilities. The same is kind of with the probe. You just have, you know, a tiny probe that does nothing, that doesn't have problems with the CPU, whatever. It just goes request, request, and there you'll find out how do the uh, independently from the loaders, how do request latencies change? Okay, that is the general whoops setup. What we're going to do next is we have that set up somehow. And then let's make it simple. We're going to do a couple of test runs. So the oops, that isn't perfect. So the first test run. Let's say we're going to send 1,000 requests per second. Hopefully, you can read that. Thousands against the server. And we want to find out, hey, probe, how long does it take for you to get answers? And then we're going to repeat that process a couple of times, depending on much how much time we have in this talk. So we could send 5,000. Well, that is a very weird five, sorry. 5,000 requests per second. We could send 20,000 requests per second to the server, 40,000. You know, and keep going like that. So d just different rounds, essentially, of cranking up the load and asking the probe, hey, probe, what, what, what about the latencies? In fact, the interesting thing about this whole scenario is when you go to the source code repository uh, later on, there is one Java main class. You can do the same thing with JMeter, with Gatling, whatever have you. I'm going to show you something <laughs> inside one Java class. Um, that Java class contains a bit of code, and it essentially sets up the loaders, the probe. It runs the unit test. Uh, it runs the load test, in this case, for 30 seconds, cranks up the load, and gets these response times. We can talk about the code after the talk. What I'm just going to do now is I'm going to run this class once, because one test run takes around two minutes, whatever, to generate some data. And I want to run this multiple times live. Hopefully, everything is working. And uh, so we don't have to wait for new test runs to finish. The first test run, you see a variable here. How many requests should one loader send against my, against my tax rate endpoint? We have four loaders. We'll, we'll tell the loaders to send 250 requests a second. So we're going to hit the server with 1,000 requests per second. All of that is happening in AWS EC2. I picked a random instance. It doesn't matter what type of instance type you're, you're picking. I just picked the cheapest one, the, the cheapest general purpose one. And I'm running this scenario against my server. While this is running, we need to do something else. Because by now, you might be like, OK, Marco, I know this stuff. I mean, what's so special about it? What's special about it is we need to collect a bit more data during our test run. And this is something I have seen, not seen, <laughs> made so many times in the past. What data am I talking about? Well, it would be nice to find out if every test run was reliable, kind of. It would be nice if we got some data, some big picture data. So the first thing is, I want some big picture data. What is big picture data? Well, let me take a different color. Let's get some operating system data from everyone that takes part in the load test, so from the servers, from the loaders, from the probe. And what I'm thinking about is I want to know about the CPU usage of every participant in the test. I want to know about the memory usage of every participant in the test. I want to know about the network usage of every participant in the test. If I had, I don't know, file uploads, whatever, I would like to know what about my HDD, about my SDD, about my hard drive usage, all of that stuff. Can I get some data? And how would I interpret that data? Big picture stuff. There's also more. Instead of just having the big picture, it would be nice to have the detailed picture. <laughs> Detailed picture. What does detailed mean? Well, for one, it would be interesting if we think about an HTTP servlet 
of a very simple HTTP server in that case, how long does my HTTP server and maybe the database and everything behind that, how long does it take to process my request? So I'm going to call that the business logic request times. Whoops. So how long does my, let me change colors again. How long does my business logic take? Only that the, the HTTP server is so, so far without the chatty code that is also executing, obviously, whenever a, ha a request is being handled. It would be super cool to maybe even get some profiling data, which means, I don't know if you've seen flame graphs before, we're going to talk about that also. Uh, if you have flame graphs, for example, C live flame graphs from a CPU memory usage, what methods from your code maybe you waste a lot of CPU, which methods might waste a lot of memory, stuff like that. It would be interesting to get um, garbage collection data and dig through the garbage collection logs. Again, for every participant in the system, and I'll just make it a big, whoop, let's see the big picture here, right? Why do we want to do that? The thing is, from the server perspective, I, I mean, it's clear we want to see if we crank up the load, is my server maybe a bit CPU, um, bound, is it memory bound, network bound, what happens basically once we crank up the load? Just the big picture. Why would we take the same data for the loaders? Because surprisingly, generating a load also takes, as I mentioned before, CPU and all of that stuff. And we want to make sure that the loaders aren't the bottleneck in our load testing scenario. And loaders can actually be pre pretty soon be the bottleneck. That's why we also split them up. We don't just have one loader. We actually have like one to five to ten loaders that are able to generate the load consistently that we want to send against the server. And then the detailed data, well, makes sense for the server. We don't need to have that for the probe and for the loaders. But in any case, this is what you want to have for every single test run of your load tests. All right. That is that what we're going to do, and that is what I would propose you as the process to take back home and also do in your own projects. Let's have a look at what just happened. Uh, I can see that the first test run uh, worked perfectly fine. I'm just going to run another test run with 5,000 requests per second before I tell you what happened. Let me just quickly run that. Right. So. What my, maybe just one last uh, thing here, what this main class I'm showing you is doing, it runs that load testing scenario, it creates those files, it creates a big picture CPU memory network by just executing Linux commands on the machines, and then it downloads the files into my project after the test run. And now in the part two is we need to find out how do we read those files, how do we interpret those files, what do we do with that information? When I go back to my project, and this is, I understand it's the last uh, talk of the day, you will see some data now, and I'll try to make it as nice as possible for you and walk you through all this. If you use my project, you'll find the results folder. After every test run, a new folder gets popped up into the results folder in my target folder. And you can see I have a folder for my test run that's a timestamp at 7.16. And I also have a general folder plot, which summarizes all the test runs together. I'm going to start with the plot HTML file here, because we're going to see it a bit more often uh, in the next 20 minutes. Let me open it up. Right. What do we see here? Well, first of all, we have a histogram. We can actually debate if that is a histogram. It's, uh, I had that discussion many times before. It is a highly high dynamic range histogram. What, that, what you see here is a blue line. The blue line tells you, well, the test run has been 1,000 requests per second. So the loaders hammered 1,000 requests per second. The blue line, however, is the request for the, that the probe made. So not the loaders, but just the probe. On the left, you see the latency in microseconds. So what you actually see here is that the probe made requests, like these one, two requests per second. They took 1,000 microseconds, 1,500 microseconds, so 1 millisecond, 1.5 milliseconds, which is absolutely nothing, but it's expected because our server doesn't do anything. So that is the left side, and the, 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 the y-axis, and the x-axis is the percentile. 
it just gives you a quick overview of when I hover over here. You can s hopefully can also read that here, yes. Um, 50 percentile simply means that 50 percent of the requests that the probe made were done in roughly, were done faster than 1,200 microseconds or 1 1.2 milliseconds. Same thing if you, go if you go up that line here, 90 p 90th percentile, 1.3 milliseconds. It just gives you a quick overview of you know, the response times of your probe, and it's going to be very interesting to see what happens once we crank up the load, what happens to this plot, what happens to the, the histogram. Okay, we have that. We're going to continue. For every test run, you'll find subfolders. Subfolders with all the data for all the participants inside the load test. Meaning, we have four subfolders for my four loaders with the IP address here. We have a folder for the probe. We have a folder for the server that contains all the data I've been talking about. Big picture, small picture, detailed picture, what have you. Let's have a look inside these. And again, the, the, the structure you're seeing here is just something that I came up with. What is important that when you do these load tests, you actually get the data in, in any format you like and have a look at that for every test run. All right, operating system. We can see we have some data inside here. For the operating system, for example, we have a CPU log, a memory log, a network log. I'm just quickly going to show you what these look like and what you can expect here, and I'm going to give you a tiny bit of data overload. What my test class does is it basically snapshots the CPU usage every 10 seconds. So you'll find a table here. Whoops, that is one table, 15, 15, 48. 15, fif at f uh, 10 seconds later at 58, and then 10 seconds later at 08. I'm going to make it real quick. What you'll see here, what you'll need to expect from, from a table like that is, you'll see all the CPUs. My loader is quite beefy. It has eight CPUs. And you can see, and that's what we're going to do, is we're going to make it simple. We're going to have a look at the all line, which is the average line for the loaders. Again, ignore all the columns. We're going to make it real simple. You just go to, to the right. And you can see that, on average, all the CPUs were idle for 98% of the time. 98.72% of the time. Which means, for the loader to generate the load, he didn't have to spend much CPU time. So that, that wasn't the bottleneck for our loader. If you increase that to 100,000 requests, whatever, you would actually see, whoops, uh, that suddenly the loader has to do something. And at that point, once the CPU usage gets unreliable, so for example, 90% um, usage, you need to scrap your test and you cannot take it as is because the loader was actually overloaded, not your server. Right, so you have a look at that and you know you go through these lines and you check it off and you say, okay, that looks fine. The loader was absolutely fine generating these, I think, 250 requests. Then let me, by the way, I just saw that we have another test run that finished. Let me just execute one more test run. And sorry, it's a bit switching back and forth because I wanted to do it live. So I'm just going to generate a new test run with 5,000 requests per second. Right, like so, 5,000. So now we're executing 20,000 requests a second against our endpoint. OK, up next, memory log. Big picture. The memory log also does snapshots every 10 seconds. So one table here is one snapshot, another snapshot, another snapshot, another, sna another snapshot. Um, we can see the loader again has plenty of memory, 30 gigabytes. It only uses 386 me megabytes or 427 megabytes. And again, for our use case now, memory, at least the overall memory picture, isn't a problem. You're just going to have a look at that quickly, especially a constrained memory machines, maybe Docker containers, whatever, and find out, hey, we crank up the load. What happens to the memory usage? Is memory maybe the problem after all? We have the same thing for network usage. Don't be scared, it's, it's the scariest table you'll see. Uh, essentially, as you can imagine, we have snapshots every 10 seconds, only that now two tables are one snapshot, and there's so many columns that they are on, uh, on two lines. And importantly, from, that, from those tables is essentially only two columns, and this is one column here, received kilobits per second and transferred kilobits per second. So basically, the amount of data you're receiving and you're sending out. Uh, if you want to find out megabits, like for example, 100 megabit or 1 gigabit, whatever, megabits, you divide by 1,000. And you can see that, well, obviously, 
Dividing by 1,000 will give you 0 0.059 or 0 0.044, whatever, megabits, which is far away from <laughs> a network limit like 100 Mbit, for example. Still, good practice to have a look at those numbers. Then one thing, which, is, which I've uh, encountered many times before, you want to make sure when you run these load testing scenarios that actually every request you did was successful. And not because there was some bug inside, you hit 500s, 400s, the API changed. Again, that would make the whole test result invalid, basically. This file is essentially just my test takes roughly 30 seconds. And what you see here is at, at second zero of the test, at second one of the test, at second two of the test, this specific loader sends 250 requests. So every second of the test, he sent 250 requests. And they all came back with 200, which is absolutely fine. Again, you want to make sure, is my data reliable? Is my whole test run reliable? And if you start finding 500s, 400s, whatever here, then you have to repeat your test run because it's unreliable. And then, and actually, my, 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 my full talk, we would actually go through more data of every loader, but I have to kind of you know, cut it down a tiny bit. Repeat the same process for every participant. It's also something, as a developer, you wouldn't actually like to do. It's like, oh, yet another CPU log, yet another network log. Oh, I have assumptions. No, you need to check out the data and not have too many assumptions about the whole thing. Let's have a look at the server because the server has, well, obviously the, sa the same thing. Let's see the CPU log for 1,000 requests a second. Well, the server had to do something, so he was busy f like 10% at that point in time, 5% at that point in time, 2% at th that point in time. So the server actually noted he had to work a bit, you know, to process all the requests, but not too much. Memory, I think, will be fine for the server. So if you have a look at the snapshots, well, 360 megabytes, whoops. Uh, 378 megabytes, so network isn't a problem. And the network log, you'll see, aha, uh -huh, the server, he actually has, you know, a bit of traffic, like one Mbit, oh, no, sorry, that was the <laughs> wrong column, 0 0.017, whatever. So a bit more traffic in the loaders, obviously, which makes sense because four loaders are hammering one server. Now, ha, another test run has finished. Let me just do one more test run before we continue with the, with the data. One test run of 7,500, so 30,000 requests in total. Let's see what happens. Let me run this. And meanwhile, we haven't had a look at the plot I in a while. I'll just show you what happened to the plot. The plot got two more lines. Earlier, you just saw the blue line, which was for 1,000 requests per second. Now it also has two more lines, which is for 5,000 requests per second, which is the red line, which is also down here somewhere. And you've got the line for 20,000 requests per second. Again, remember, this is the response types of the probe that you're looking at. And how you would read this, in general, you would see, uh, still see, well, let's say all the requests for the probe took between, like, uh, this is one millisecond again, this is microseconds, so divide by 1,000, one millisecond, up to maybe five milliseconds here, 5.3 milliseconds. Still not a whole amount of time, but again, you can already see that with 20,000 requests per second, you know, at least the, the percentile, let's see wh where that graph goes off, the 96th percentile, that's a hard word to say, you know, suddenly starts to change. So at least 96% of the, the requests, they had the same response time, more or less, and then for the last couple of requests, you know, suddenly the re response time spiked. And it could be indicated that now the server maybe is, you know, uh, starting to have trouble. We would need to double check this with the CPU usage and also with the next test runs we're about to make or we're still making at the moment. All right, let me switch back while this test run is, is still running um, because we haven't quite checked out all the other data yet that comes with, with the server. CPU log memory network, and by the way, also a hard drive, SSD, whatever, if there was such a, a, such a test case, you could also have that data here. Then we have one more HTML file, which makes sense to have. Ooh. What do you see here? Well, that is essentially the, the amount of time it takes for our servlet to handle the requests. 
excluding the chatty code. So it's only the time spent inside our HTTP servlet and maybe the backend services behind it. At the moment, there aren't any, so it's just our HTTP servlet. The graphic itself has <laughs> two parts to it. Let's have a look at the lower part because it's simpler, throughput. It's a nice straight line, and you can see that the server handled 1,000 requests every second of the test again, so second zero, second one, that's, uh, that, that's the x-axis. And um, the y-axis is the request, the number of requests, and you want the line to look like this. If the line suddenly starts to look like this, you would know that the server has problems, or uh, problems answering the requests. The top part, I'll make it real quick, again, percentiles. What you see here is x-axis, number of seconds of the test. Y-axis is the response time in microseconds again. So we're really talking 20 microseconds, 100 microseconds, so that's 0.02 milliseconds, so it's almost nothing. It's a bit stupid with that simple example, but it's just nice you know, to, to keep in mind, have a picture, have a diagram of what your business logic takes to handle the requests. It makes sense to have a look at that and maybe find out that certain types of requests, certain endpoints have huge issues you know, handling the requests. Um, the red bars you can see here is essentially how long did it take for 99% of the requests uh, to get handled. And this is in microseconds. Hopefully you can see that 99% of the requests <laughs> at second zero took 12 to 58 microseconds to be handled. 10 to 51 microseconds to be handled, 9 to 44 microseconds to be handled. It's just really not a lot of time to handle those requests. And then there was the odd request that took longer, like uh, 120 microseconds, 100 microseconds, stuff like that. And if we had you know, more code, more complex code, you would actually see the garbage collection pauses kick in. You would see these spikes after a couple of seconds uh, in, in, in frequent in intervals, for example. Just as a, big over, uh, as a detailed overview of what is your, is your business logic actually doing at the moment. And now, and then my information overload with the diagrams and whatever will be, will be done. I promised you something about async profilers about how to profile your application and what to do with that data. Look at that nice little flame graph. Don't worry, um, we'll make it, I'll make it as simple as possible if you've never seen a flame graph before. So first of all, uh, the colors. Colors, green, yellow, orange, red. What you see is the Java code that you're executing is in color green. Red color, yellow color, orange color is the operating system, the code of your JVM, and the kernel code, uh, the kernel of your the Linux operating system, actually, what kind of code they're executing to handle your requests, and we can ignore these other colors for now. We just want to focus on the green color. Then, this is a flame graph of the CPU usage, and it gives you a relative picture of how much time was spent, how much time did my CPU spend, not in absolute numbers, but in relative numbers, to handle those requests that I sent, my text rate requests. And, well, Chatty consists of a thread pool, so actually <laughs> everything it does is it calls thread run over and over again. That's why you see, you know, this big green bar down here saying, well, I'm just running threads. Most of the time is spent running threads. Makes sense. But we want to find out how much time was spent in my plain Java servlet. And thankfully, you can actually search on that page, plain Java servlet. Can you see that small highlight here in violet? And it just gives you a quick visualization of from all the, from all the handling time that my CPU actually wasted, let's say, say like that, this tiny block was spent in my HTTP servlet. If I did more work, if I do, uh, did more CPU-heavy work, it will obviously look a bit different, but in our case, it's just a tiny, tiny percentage. You can even drill down a bit more, and then you'll see inside my plain Java servlet do get method, where was the time spent, the CPU time in that case? And it was spent about a third in my text rate to string method, which concatenated the JSON, uh, the, the, the JSON. then generating a random number was the biggest part that was spent, and then, you know, a couple of jetty, I don't know, setting the content type or whatever. Again, it just gives you a quick 
In this case, it might seem a bit nonsensical because not much time is being spent here. But for real applications, it make m might make sense from time to time. Have a look at the detailed picture. How much time is being spent from a CPU or memory-wise in different methods for different requests? Stuff like that. All right, let's see what happened with our latest test run. If that, yes, it finished, and you might have guessed, right, we're going to have a look at the plot. The plot. Actually, let me just do one more thing because I just saw that I want to, I was, uh, I just kept on talking. I want to run one more test run <laughs> with 40,000 requests in total. Let me just see if that worked. Right, so it's running. Good. Um, the plot so far, going back to the plot, it's interesting because th what the plot actually shows now is, you know, the yellow line with the 20,000 requests per second, you saw there was some change in the percentile. With the 30,000 requests per second, for whatever reason, suddenly the line is pretty, pretty close to the other, other requests. And we would have to find out why that actually is. Was there maybe like some hiccup? Did my maybe my probes hit the, the endpoints during a, a GC run or whatever? In fact, the thing is, you'll have to make sure, I'm just running this with 30 seconds every test run, you'll have to make sure to repeatedly, <laughs> to repeatedly repeat these experiments with longer test runs, more data, to get a feeling of, you know, what, is wh what happens with these lines. Still, between one and five milliseconds, not yet too crazy, and we'll see with the 40,000 requests per second, we'll see, hopefully, we'll see <laughs> what happens if you really hammer the server, and if we suddenly get a completely different line uh, that you might not yet expect. All right, we have that test run. Let me see what else do we have, what other data we have. We're still in the first test run. Something for you to keep in mind, J Hiccup. I actually, it's another, another visualization, another tool. J Hiccup gives you, that you can use, you ca gives you pauses of your JVM whenever your JVM stalls. I don't want to overload you with more data, with more visuals, with more dialogues and whatever. It's just another tool, keep in mind, just like with everything else, it could give you hints of when was your JVM maybe stalling, when would your JVM have problems, and then you can check that out as well. It's just something to, to take away. Okay, then we did that for one test run and we're going to make it fast. We're not going to go through the other test runs. I'm just going to have a look at the second to last test run now, which is this. And again, that was, let me just double check what we had. That was 30,000 requests. So this folder here is with 30,000 requests. I'm checking the server for the 30,000 requests and I just want to have a look at the CPU memory network if something changes, changed. And here you can see already that CPU usage for the 30,000 requests per second is already pretty damn high because CPU usage got up to, let's say it's busy 60% of the time, 63% of the time, 60% of the time, and here also 55% of the time. So it's already pretty high to handle those 30,000 requests. Memory usage, let's see what happened. Memory usage, because I mean, I'm not allocating objects, I'm not doing anything crazy. 15 gigabytes, 502 megabytes being used, that's also fine. Network usage. Now we can see that suddenly, you know, my server is receiving 5 Mbits a second. It's also sending out 7 Mbits a second. So actually these numbers increase, which was to be expected because our loaders are now hammering mu many, ma many more requests and we're sending back many more responses. Still far away from 100 Mbit. By the way, if you really want to dig really deep into the whole rabbit hole. The interesting thing is we have been looking at the total bandwidth so far. AWS instances actually have a limit on the TCP packages you can send in every second. And they will start dropping these packages if, if you break the limit. It's not something you will encounter unless you go to some AWS forums, whatnot. But um, just keep in mind, you might also want to have a look at these numbers here. It's the receive packets per second, transmitted uh, transfer packets per second. Just a tiny, tiny story. Um, the performance log, I suppose. Let's see the performance log for the second to last test run. Right, you can see here the performance log already kind of changed. 
So when we look at the throughput, the server was able to handle 30,000 requests per second. So we, we see this straight line, which is perfect, which we wanted to see. But then you can see that now the maximum values suddenly, you know, change. Six milliseconds, uh, five milliseconds, five milliseconds. And that could be my GC pulses, could be something else. We'd have to find that out, kind of, what, why that is. But that is what a more realistic, you know, basically uh, performance graph of my business logic would look like once the load increases. All right, let's see what our la last test run does. It is coming to a close. And if I did everything right and correct, let's see what my plot looks like. Looks different. And actually, uh, also, if you now look at the other you know, <laughs> uh, lines in the histogram, you can see that it didn't really matter these microsecond differences. But suddenly, the longest request takes 140 milliseconds or 140,000 microseconds. In fact, only 30% of the requests, they took up till 1.4 milliseconds, and then suddenly it spikes up, whoop, and then you get this graph here. And the server is still responding, but suddenly something that took like one or two milliseconds now takes 150 milliseconds or 140 milliseconds. So that should definitely be the server is, co is coming to its limit. To double check that, let's have a tiny quick look just to hammer that in, the process, CPU log, because we're just wasting CPU here. And what you can see is that we have a couple of snapshots. The first snapshot, the server was did 25% of the time busy, then 70% of the time, and then the third snapshot, the server was busy for 90, more than 90% of the time. And that is basically at the limit, 93% of the time. Corresponds well with our graph, obviously, that we just saw. And at this point, with you know looking at that plot in the last eight minutes or so, it might make sense to talk about a couple of well things because I haven't really been lying to you so far, but what we did so far is a bit too far from removed from the real world. Why is that? I talked about it at the beginning. Um, obviously, we have no database and no other microservices, whatever. We'll, t we'll talk about it in a second. But let me just write down a couple of you know, principles so far. What we did is we focused on absolute numbers. What I mean by that is like, like these kids, I don't know if you, if you played these card games as a kid where you had like a bigger car and whatever and you compared the PS and all of that and then the guy won with the most uh, points or the CPU ranking, so everything. We always like to, we humans like to rank on absolute numbers and we say, aha, 1,000 requests per second, 5,000, so 5,000 is better. The funny thing is our whole use case, just having one endpoint with the one text rate is obviously not realistic. An application, every application consists of more endpoints, and you'll also have to find out what is the user's journey. So, for example, a mobile app might have uh, just a couple of, maybe one, two requests, but if, I, if, I'm, um, if I'm browsing a website, one a request on a website, or a user going to a website, will obviously trigger maybe five, seven backend requests, something like that you'll need to figure out kind of what is a realistic user journey for my application to make the whole scenario a bit more realistic. First of all, the second one, the, the, the second thing is, obviously you can't run this with just a Jetty server. You need to have a real landscape, adding the DB. You need to add maybe your microservices, whatever. And you'll need to run the whole scenario, not just against your server, you need to run it in isolation against your database, against your microservices, and then against all of them together. It's a whole lot of running, a whole lot of data chewing and finding out which uh, system was the problem in my load test. In fact, what you'll find out, and this is what, why databases have, have gotten such a big rap, is essentially when you have a cold chain like this, right? And the first system can handle 1,000 requests per second. The second one, only 500 and the third one, 2K requests per second to make it real simple. It doesn't matter how much you auto scale this guy into, uh, into oblivion, the bottleneck will be your 500 here, which might be your database, whatever. And you need to make sure to put the whole system landscape in a place where it resembles the real world as much as possible. 
so user journey, realistic user journey, and also, you know, obviously realistic servers, landscape, and all of that type of stuff, and run the whole process against the whole landscape and the isolated pieces. Then you'll have a better understanding of, okay, what does my absolute number actually mean? What does it mean that my servlet can handle like 50,000 requests, 10,000 requests? You'll find out, obviously, that the requests will drop, but maybe that's enough for your, for your website. By the way, in terms of not just claiming stuff, when you search for Stack Exchange performance, for example, Stack Exchange is the whole, let's say, network behind Stack Overflow, everything else. What they do is they publish their um, performance numbers and everything, basically the number of web servers they have, number of SQL servers they have and whatnot. What you can see here is they have nine web servers and they say, at least, that on average they have 300 requests per second that they handle and peak 450 requests per second. And I'm not comparing my servlet to Stack, Stack Exchange, but it brings me to the last point is expectation management in load testing. If someone comes to you and tells you, hey, I'm, go I'm gonna have to handle 10,000 requests, it's not gonna happen. The number is basically made up. Unless you have you know, historic data which tells you, well, maybe on Black Friday, I know for, 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 for a fact that my traffic is gonna explode, then it's totally fine. But unless you're launching a Stack Overflow tomorrow, and most average business applications are far away from, from Stack Overflow, you won't have 10,000 requests. It doesn't make sense 10,000 requests to test that stuff. Like 10,000, 10,000, 10,000, what we did. Or 40,000. If you have 40,000 requests per second, 40,000, 40,000, 40,000, it's not gonna happen for, for your average application. In fact, you're not gonna make 300 requests per second, constant pressure, it's not gonna happen. You're probably, going to have dozens of requests per second, per minute, something like that in, in that kind of range. And your problem won't be what happens if 10,000 users come tomorrow. Your problem will be in simplified terms saying, hey, how many SQL statements, for example, do I execute when I run some piece of code? Uh, how many microservices am I calling? Or what, what's happening there? And it's all about expectation management, pushing back on anyone who comes to you with these unrealistic scenarios and saying, hey, I don't believe we're going to have to handle 10,000 users tomorrow, even though you maybe from a business pers perspective might like to see that. Again, if you have historic data, scratch everything I'm saying. If you're launching something to an existing audience where you know, hey, there's going to be 1 million users uh, right there tomorrow, again, scratch what I'm saying. Other than that, get some expectation management in. And let me just write that down because <laughs> I forgot to write it. Number four somewhere here, expectations, expectations, right, which is a social problem. Now, to sum things up kind of what you just saw, <laughs> I want you to take a couple of things away. It doesn't matter if you're using, like I did, uh, this main Java class where I used uh, some orchestration tool that the Chetty guys provided to you know, run these load testing scenarios, or if you're using JMeter, or whatever you're doing. You cannot just run your load tests against, from your developer machine against some other machine and then say, hey, that's my absolute number. The number you're getting doesn't mean anything, essentially. You'll have to verify all these load test runs with some more data and find out how reliable was my load test. And then, before you start all of that, before you do the load testing, you need to get a reliable picture of what type of load can you expect. You don't want to do limit testing. We, also, we always want to test the limit. When does my server actually break down? No, you just want to make sure that with the load you're expecting, the server can handle it quite fine, which means 10, 20, 30% CPU usage with a buffer above, not like 90 or 95% CPU usage. And if you get that expe expectation management done and properly set up, then, at the end, you won't have to worry about scaling your Java web application anymore. And, by the way, if you find out with these experiments that for your application, maybe, a Raspberry Pi is enough, then please go to your manager, tell him to give you the difference between the AWS instance, the Raspberry Pi, and tell me about it. I, I would actually love to hear that. But that is on the spot it. Let's see if there is any questions, if there's anything 
that we have. Right. Let me just open up the questions. One question, do you know any other tools to do such tests, to cross-check them with each other? Do you recommend any? What is the tool we've just seen? Right, so the tools you've just seen, there's actually a ton of custom code that I did, and then the Chatty developers, and you can actually, I'll send you the repository. It has a readme I came up with, uh, describing you what you need to do to re re repeat those tests. It's a very simple orchestration library to, to s set up these servers and then to run these HTTP client tests, for example. It's not a whole lot of code, it's just two existing libraries that the Chatty guys themselves use for their clients to test these scenarios. As I said, again, to cross-check them with each other, actually, I don't know if there's, you know, for all these, as I said before, in the past, I haven't seen that level of rigor when doing those low tests, like checking the, the, the operating system usage, uh, checking CPU memory and all that kind of stuff. So I don't know, to be honest, but I'll try and find out if there's any other alternatives apart from what you've just seen, essentially, which is just some custom code. All right, then, last but not least, let me give you the, well, nothing actually. <laughs> the, <laughs> the, the, the outro. Outro is the repository. If you want to, you can, wh wh what you just saw, you can actually clone it. Uh, the repository is in GitHub, Marco Bila, my name, slash high performance Java. The repository is slightly misnamed because, uh, for whatever reason, but that is where you'll find the code that you just saw me execute. And then you just need a couple of servers in AWS, and I can actually run you through it afterwards if you want to. If you want to, check out, obviously, Twitter, Marco Bila, website, Marco Bila, email, marco at jetbrains.com. Uh, get in touch. You can ask me questions anytime. I will try and answer. And I think that's about it. Thank you for listening. I hope you learned something. <laughs>